Epicurus to Minesius. Greetings. Let no one delay the study of philosophy while young, nor weary of it when old. For no one is either too young or too old for the health of the soul. He who says either that the time for philosophy has not yet come, or that it has passed, is like someone who says that the time for happiness has not yet come, or that it has passed. Therefore, both young and old must philosophize, the latter so that although old, he may stay young in good things owing to gratitude for what has occurred, the former so that although young, he too may be like an old man owing to his lack of fear of what is to come. Therefore, one must practice the things which produce happiness, since if that is present, we have everything, and if it is absent, we do everything in order to have it. Do and practice what I constantly told you to do, believing these to be the elements of living well. First, believe that God is an indestructible and blessed animal, in accordance with the general conception of God commonly held, and do not ascribe to God anything foreign to his indestructibility or repugnant to his blessedness. Believe of him everything which is able to preserve his blessedness and indestructibility. For gods do exist, since we have a clear knowledge of them, but they are not such as the many believe them to be, for they do not adhere to their own views about the gods. The man who denies the gods of the many is not impious, but rather he who ascribes to the gods the opinions of the many. For the pronouncements of the many about the gods are not basic grasps, but false suppositions. Hence come the greatest harm from the gods to bad men, and the greatest benefits to the good. For the gods always welcome men who are like themselves, being congenial to their own virtues, and considering that whatever is not such is uncongenial. Get used to believing that death is nothing to us, for all good and bad consists in sense experience, and death is the privation of sense experience. Hence, a correct knowledge of the fact that death is nothing to us makes the mortality of life a matter for contentment, not by adding a limitless time to life, but by removing the longing for immortality. For there is nothing fearful in life for one who has grasped that there is nothing fearful in the absence of life. Thus, he is a fool who says that he fears death not because it will be painful when present, but because it is painful when it is still to come. For that which, while present, causes no distress, causes unnecessary pain when merely anticipated. So death, the most frightening of bad things, is nothing to us, since when we exist, death is not yet present, and when death is present, then we do not exist. Therefore it is relevant neither to the living nor to the dead, since it does not affect the former, and the latter do not exist. But the many sometimes flee death as the greatest of bad things, and sometimes choose it as a relief from the bad things in life. But the wise man neither rejects life nor fears death, for living does not offend him, nor does he believe not living to be something bad. And just as he does not unconditionally choose the largest amount of food but the most pleasant food, so he savours not the longest time but the most pleasant. He who advises the young man to live well and the old man to die well is simple-minded, not just because of the pleasing aspects of life, but because the same kind of practice produces a good life and a good death. Much worse is he who says that it is good not to be born, but when born to pass through the gates of Hades as quickly as possible. For if he really believes what he says, why doesn't he leave life? For it's easy for him to do, if he's firmly decided on it. But if he's joking, he is wasting his time among men who do not welcome it. We must remember that what will happen is neither unconditionally within our power, nor unconditionally outside our power, so that we will not unconditionally expect that it will occur, nor despair of it as unconditionally not going to occur. One must reckon that of desires, some are natural, some groundless, and of the natural desires, some are necessary, and some merely natural. And of the necessary, some are necessary for happiness, and some for freeing the body from troubles, and some for life itself. The unwavering contemplation of these enables one to refer every choice and avoidance to the health of the body and the freedom of the soul from disturbance, since this is the goal of a blessed life. For we do everything for the sake of being neither in pain nor in terror. 
As soon as we achieve this state, every storm in the soul is dispelled, since the animal is not in a position to go after some need, nor to seek something else to complete the good of the body and the soul. For we are in need of pleasure only when we are in pain because of the absence of pleasure, and when we are not in pain, then we no longer need pleasure. And this is why we say that pleasure is the starting point and goal of living blessedly. For we recognize this as our first innate good, and this is our starting point for every choice and avoidance, and we come to this by judging every good thing by the criterion of feeling. And it is just because this is the first innate good that we do not choose every pleasure. But sometimes we pass up many pleasures when we get a larger amount of what is uncongenial from them. And we believe many pains to be better than pleasures when a greater pleasure follows for a long while if we endure the pains. So every pleasure is a good thing, since it has a nature congenial to us, but not every one is to be chosen. Just as every pain too is a bad thing, but not every one is such as to always be avoided. It is, however, appropriate to make all these decisions by comparative measurement and an examination of the advantages and disadvantages. For at some times we treat the good thing as bad, and conversely the bad thing as good. And we believe that self-sufficiency is a great good, not in order that we might make do with few things under all circumstances, but so that if we do not have a lot, we can make do with few, being genuinely convinced that those who least need extravagance enjoy it the most, and that everything natural is easy to obtain, and whatever groundless is hard to obtain and that simple flavours provide a pleasure equal to that of an extravagant lifestyle when all pain from want is removed, and barley cakes and water provide the greatest pleasure when someone in want takes them in. Therefore, becoming accustomed to simple, not extravagant ways of life makes one completely healthy, makes men unhesitant in the face of life's necessary duties, puts us in a better condition for the times of extravagance which occasionally come along, and makes us fearless in the face of chance. So when we say that pleasure is the goal, we do not mean the pleasures of the profligate, or the pleasures of consumption, as some believe, either from ignorance and disagreement, or from deliberate misinterpretation, but rather the lack of pain in the body and disturbance in the soul. For it is not drinking bouts and continuous partying and enjoying boys and women, or consuming fish and the other dainties of an extravagant table which produce the pleasant life, but sober calculation which searches out the reasons for every choice and avoidance and drives out the opinions which are the source of the greatest turmoil for men's souls. Prudence is the principle of all these things and it is the greatest good. That is why prudence is a more valuable thing than philosophy, for prudence is the source of all the other virtues teaching that it is impossible to live pleasantly without living prudently, honourably, and justly, and impossible to live prudently, honourably, and justly without living pleasantly, for the virtues are natural adjuncts of the pleasant life, and the pleasant life is inseparable from them. For who do you believe is better than the man who has pious opinions about the gods, is always fearless about death, has reasoned out the natural goal of life and understands that the limit of good things is easy to achieve completely and easy to provide, and that the limit of bad things either has a short duration or causes little trouble. As to fate, introduced by some as the mistress of all, he is scornful, saying rather that some things happen of necessity, others by chance, and others by our own agency, and that he sees that necessity is not answerable to anybody, that chance is unstable, while what occurs by our own agency is autonomous, and that it is to this that praise and blame are attached. For it would be better to follow the stories told about the gods than to be a slave to the fate of the natural philosophers, for the former suggests a hope of escaping bad things by honouring the gods, but the latter involves an inescapable and merciless necessity. And the wise man believes that chance is not a god, as the many think, for nothing is done in a disorderly way by God, nor that it is an uncertain cause, for he does not think that anything good or bad with respect to living blessedly is given by chance to men, although it does provide the starting points of great good and bad things, and he thinks it better to be unlucky in a rational way than lucky in a senseless way, for it's better for a good decision not to turn out right in action than for a bad decision to turn out right because of chance.
Practice these and the related precepts day and night, by yourself and with a like-minded friend, and you will never be disturbed, either when awake or in sleep, and you will live as a god among men. For a man who lives among immortal goods is in no respect like a mere mortal animal.